Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning to all of you attending this morning's event, uh, the book launch and forum on Malaysian healthcare melodies and remedies uh, organized by the Federation of Private Medical Practitioners Associations Malaysia or FPMPAM. Uh, welcome to all of you who are here uh, this morning uh, and willing to uh, contribute your Saturday morning to this important discussion, to join us here in being able to deliberate, discuss, and perhaps even take away uh, some insight into what's going on with Malaysian healthcare. And we have with us uh, for this event quite a list of luminaries, which include you uh, yourselves as participating, uh, participants, uh, who will be able to contribute uh, to both the discussions that will occur during the panel uh, and forum, as well as listening in to the review that we conducted later on. Let me just say before we begin that the events over the past 18 months have been quite uh, disruptive for the Malaysian healthcare system. Uh, we have seen many of the issues, gaps, challenges, unresolved uh, obstacles and uh, simmering problems that lie underneath the surface of uh, Malaysian healthcare come up uh, in a vigorous way in the, back, uh, the backdrop of COVID-19. And it is a situation where many of the issues that uh, were raised by the people who have worked in healthcare for decades, even maybe 30 or 40 years ago, have been highlighting for urgent intervention and the imposition of reforms, but were not heeded to uh, either due to the lack of political will from previous administrations as well, even amongst the healthcare stakeholders themselves, uh, unwilling to change. So many of these issues have come to the fore and we've seen them emerge during the COVID-19 crisis in a really bad way. Uh, yesterday marked more than 300 people have died of COVID-19 with uh, us reaching around 25,000 people infected. Uh, reportedly uh, in a day. These are all milestones for uh, a healthcare system, which has in the past been able to respond effectively to outbreaks with, which have emerged under different administrations and the different leadership uh, of the uh, healthcare stakeholders, as well as the healthcare leaders that we're having here uh, this morning. So we're fortunate that today, not only are we going to be launching a book, uh, that will be looking at the various issues in Malaysia's healthcare system and the proposed solutions. So we're not just talking about uh, where the problems are, but also how we can go about fixing it. We're also going to be having a chance to talk about and comment on some of the ongoing developments that are uh, occurring in the healthcare space. And most importantly, uh, looking at what kind of out-of-the-box thinking is needed for us to be able to revamp uh, Malaysia's uh, dual healthcare system and uh, looking at eliminating the public-private uh, healthcare sector distinction, changing healthcare financing methods, and making sure that these standards are able to be applied across the, the medical facilities and ensuring that no one is left behind in the process. So uh, I will go into the introductions of the individual speakers later on uh, during today's presentation. And let me just remind to all of you that if you are unable to access this Zoom, uh, please go on to our FB page, Galen Centre, for you to be able to access and watch this forum as well as possibly ask questions should you have any. So with that, uh, I would like to just ask that uh, you uh, keep your video and uh, audio switched off. And to kick us, kick us off uh, this morning's uh, uh, festivities and illuminating discussions, let me introduce to you uh, the President of the Federation of Private Medical Practitioners Associations Malaysia, Dr. Stephen Chow, to deliver his opening remarks and to allow us to uh, uh, be uh, illuminated on some of the insights that he, as the leader of FEM, has been able to bring about with regards to this publication. So with that, uh, I hand over to Dr. Stephen Chow. Thank you, Asrul. Good morning to all. And uh, depending on which part of the world you are, uh, good day. Tansaris, Dato, YBs, uh, YABs, if any. 
fellow doctors, members of the media, gentle ladies and gentlemen. Our Malaysian healthcare system is like a sick man, really sick, lying in bed, just out of the ICU, now in, in the high dependency unit. Okay? And with every possibility of going in again in the near future. Sadly, this patient has been ill for a long time, not just today. The doctors at his side, with their fingers on his pulse, have been there for decades, advising, counseling, and hoping to maintain him in good health. But alas, it does look like all the good advice had fallen on deaf ears. Unfortunately, the powers to be have procrastinated. Their favorite term now is doing studies. Okay. Looking for second, third, and indeed endless opinions from WHO or whoever, and their various well-connected international bodies, except from the very doctors at the patient's bedside. And for more than four decades, health ministers have come and gone. Together with their favorite healthcare consultancies and think tanks. Very few of them have stayed long enough to make a mark in the term of office. We always have this third saying that the Ministry of Health is a very dangerous place okay, for political career. Our healthcare system was very much on autopilot, on a trajectory set by the technocrats many five Malaysia plans ago. There was much contemplation and just as much discussion. At the end of the day, absent political will meant no innovations and no affirmative implementation. Budgets were cut and curtailed and money meant for direct patient care was diverted to endless knee-jerk feel-good programs, which lasted as long as the minister's tenure. The patient was led to bleed and to moan. Today, we see the same patient sick in bed with nothing more than just bandits to keep him from falling apart. And such is the state of Malaysian healthcare 2021. The FPMPM commissioned the writing of this book in 2018. It was completed in a mere six months. And this was a remarkable feat by all our esteemed contributors, powered by the drive of an energetic editorial and executive team. For this, we have to thank our team of uh, executive director, uh, editor, Ms. Wu, and our executive officer, Ms. Kong. My co-author, Dr. Milton Lam, and I would like to express our greatest appreciation to all our contributing authors for a job well done. We have put together all that needs to be told in plain language. That is simple enough for all, from the layman to the almighty Bali men and Bali women. Hopefully, YBs and YABs will find some time to read this book in between their hectic journeys, rushing from one house to another for their strategic meetings to lobby for the well-being of our Raya. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, the launch of this book was postponed twice, and on both occasions, due to the untimely change in government. Today, with yet another change in government, with a new Minister of Health at the helms, amidst a backdrop of escalating COVID infections and deaths, and with a public health care system under unprecedented stress and expectations, we are proud to pre present to you Malaysian health care, melodies and remedies. This is a frank discourse on what has befallen our health care system, which was previously touted to be one of the best in the world. The contributing authors are all experts in their own way. Having had their boots on the ground for decades, 
Only they can tell you the story as seen by the deliverers of healthcare and the experience of those who depended on our system since Merdeka. This book calls for much needed reforms and examines among other important topics such as patient safety, quality of care, the overregulation of the practice of medicine, the strangulation of our general practice, which was cost effectively looking after more than 60% of our patient load, outpatient load, the escalating commercialization of the business of medicine, the phenomenal overproduction of doctors, and the perpetual inequality, inequality and inequity of healthcare delivery in our nation. There is the important chapter devoted to a radical proposal for Malaysian healthcare by none other than Tan Sri Datuk Dr. Abu Bakar Sulaiman, whose advice and guidance is not something to be dismissed. It is clear that hard lessons from this COVID-19 crisis, i.e. the old way of doing things must change. The Basel word for this is Uba. We hear this word being whispered from the jungles in Bonyo, Malaysia Bonyo, all the way to the paddy fields in the Muda Valley in Kedah. It is time to end the previous top-down approach in enacting legislations and policies related to health. Something must be seriously wrong. If after more than a year, the simple act of going to work so that you can earn money to feed your family can be a crime. Surely, all this emphasis on the issues of criminality, fear of incarceration and stigma attached to the disease will not be helpful in mobilizing the positive public opinion that we need to win this war. It must be so in order for us to be ranked today as the last out of a list of more than 50 nations in Bloomberg's COVID resilience score. The disruption caused by this pandemic has revealed not only the strengths and resilience of our healthcare system, but also its many gaps and weaknesses, which are consequences of continuing with the attitude of top-down and the government knows best. This book has many stories that foretold this coming. So what's next? For a start, we need a reform mindset at all levels of government. There is urgency to rebuild our assets at ground zero, i.e. our unshakable public and private primary care infrastructure. This is one of our greatest assets. This structure has remained intact throughout this crisis, but has been moving along separately at its own pace and direction. For a good part of this ongoing COVID defense, there was little attempt to synergize these two assets efficiently, which logically is our key fighting force in disaster response. Well, it's time to implement immediately more private public partnership initiatives in primary care, so as to harvest the best from both components of our healthcare system. On a broader perspective, is the call for a Royal Commission on Health. Eloquently argued by a contributing author and one of today's panelists, Datuk Dr. Yeo Po Hong. This is even more urgent given what we have seen and experienced over the past 18 months. The silo approach to healthcare reforms have resulted in the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing. We cannot continue to pay lip service only to the well-meaning input from patient groups, healthcare professionals, NGOs, and other stakeholders who ultimately would be impacted by such measures. What is needed are reforms based on what the riot needs and not what is dictated by the big boys in the business of medicine 
and political exigencies. It's also time to decommercialize the delivery of healthcare, do away with the many costly middlemen that have appeared in every nook and corner since the policy of privatization 30 years ago. The remarkable turnover made by some of these companies during this time of widespread human suffering is a testimony that the pandemic may mean death to many, but a gold mine for some. There is indeed lots of whispering in the great grand, uh, the grave, uh, not grave, sorry, great wine, especially among the more poetically inclined taxpayers that privatization and piratization not only rhyme, but sometimes eventually end up meaning the same as well. There is no reason for the professions in the front line and the riot to keep silent on problems affecting our personal health and the lives out of a misplaced sense of gratitude. Hence the reason for this book. Public health care is not free. It is not paid by the people we elected. It is paid by the taxpayers, you and I. And being complacent threatens the continued well-being of the people. So we have every right to demand the best quality care from the government. In ending, I would like to thank Galen Center, Asru and your organizing team for the management of this event. I would like to acknowledge our co-editors, Dr. Milton Lam, who will also be expressing his uh, views in the forum afterwards. Tan Sri Munir Majid for your timely pre-print review of our book. Our two other esteemed forum panelists, Tan Sri Baka and Datu, Dr. Yo Po Hong, and all our contributing authors. And also members of the Federation Council and all our sister societies for the unanimous support and the legal advice of the team led by Mr. Lee and Philip Cole. I would also specially acknowledge and express our appreciation to all our MPs, Ardons, ministers or ex-ministers, and senior government officers who may be present at today's event. Thank you also to all members of the media and all participants. For the new Minister of Health, congratulations to your appointment. We in the private sector look forward to working together with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stephen Chow, for those really sobering and inspiring words. Uh, there's certainly a lot for us to, to think about uh, based on what you've mentioned just now in your opening remarks. And certainly, uh, I would be remiss, and I'm reminded by the quality of that speech, but the fact that uh, besides being a distinguished uh, consultant dermatologist uh, in the Malaysian health uh, scene, that you are actually also uh, the founder of the Doctors for All outreach program that provides uh, medical services to marginalized communities. So uh, a golden heart leading uh, Federation of Private Medical Practitioners Association in Malaysia. Thank you again to Dr. Stephen Chow. So we now come to the uh, launch of the book uh, for today. And I would like to just uh, uh, read to you uh, a little bit of the, uh, the text that's behind the cover of this book. And I certainly encourage you to get it and we'll provide you with the details shortly. But you know, basically this is a compilation, a volume that is looking at the viewpoints of senior practitioners sharing their decades of experience with their fingers on the pulse of the nation. And what it reveals is especially timely uh, in the current scenario with the collapse of our healthcare system by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in this volume is arguably more than perhaps 180 years worth of experience. Uh, let me read to you a little bit of the back text just to get you a little bit teased here. Um, General practitioners relate the difficulties in providing uh, personal and affordable uh, primary care amid increasing regulations uh, to uh, provide 
Healthcare over the decades, uh, medical volunteers describe the harrowing journeys undertaken by the poor, uh, the Orang Asli, uh, and the indigenous in Sabansra just to access basic healthcare. Government programs promising health aid for low income Malaysians like Perka B40 and My Salam are deeply flawed, with assistance trickling down to just a few people. As Malaysians' health status is not improving, the uh, uh, one ringgit public health care system that worked uh, well in the last century is creaking at the seams. Let's face it, the government can't afford to pay for all Malaysian healthcare. We need a better system for the 21st century. So that's a little bit of text from the back of the book. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let us launch uh, the book that we've been waiting for this morning. and critical care units are constantly full. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the launch of the uh, Malaysian Healthcare Maladies and Remedies, the eminent publication by the Federation of Private Medical Practitioners Association of Malaysia. Uh, for the uh, ordering of the book, I would like to encourage that you place an order and the QR code is there on the screen. And since everybody seems to have a QR code now, you should be able to just scan the QR code and place it in order. The QR code is also available on the uh, agenda, which has been shared with you this morning, and you can just uh, scan there in order to place your order. At this point of time, uh, Le Chana, I would like to just call upon uh, the different speakers and the contributing uh, authors for this morning's uh, publication. Uh, let me just ask that uh, you switch on your camera so that we can take a group photo. Uh, if I could call on uh, Dr. Stephen Chow, Tan Sri Dr. Munir Majid, Tan Sri Dr. Abu Bakar Sulaiman, Dr. Dr. Yeo Ho Hong, Dr. Milton Lam, uh, contributing authors, Dr. Shamuganasan, uh, Ganesan, Dr. Pearl Leong, Dr. Lim Chi Han, Ms. Bu Sulin, Ms. Claire Tonek, uh, Professor Dato, Dr. Andrew Kiu, Dr. John Teo, Dr. Tan Po Ting, Dr. Dr. Lim Boon Cho, Dr. Mohamed Tajuddin, uh, Dr. Paul Selvaraj, and Dr. Lim Kwan Ju to switch on your uh, video and we can take a photo uh, of you uh, in the next few minutes. So for uh, the next part of uh, the session, uh, we're gonna be able to have a review of the book. And uh, to do that, we have with us all the way there from London, I think, uh, is possibly 4 a.m. <laughs> and uh, I think this is going to be something that uh, we're hoping to be able to have a good insight on. And that is uh, from a person who is no stranger to the business community in Malaysia. And that is, of course, uh, we have uh, Tan Sri uh, Dr. Munir Majid, who is an alumnus of the London uh, School of Economics and Political Science, or LSE. Uh, he is the chairman of uh, Chari ASEAN uh, Research and Advocacy and of the ASEAN Business uh, Advisory Council, Malaysia. He is the president of the ASEAN Business Club and a board member of the Institute of Strategic and 
International Studies or ISIS Malaysia. So without further ado, I hand it over to Tansri Dr. Munir Rajit. Go ahead, sir. Thank you very much, Azrum, for that introduction. Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, and uh, let me first of all thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to say a few words of review at this book launch and forum. Uh, and in particular, of course, uh, Dr. Stephen Chow, who is a, a dear friend, and, uh, and I am delighted to do so even at 4 a.m. in the morning in London. And uh, essentially, uh, this book is being published at a tragically timely time. Uh, you heard earlier Dr. Stephen Chow's passionate, uh, trenchant, uh, even angry speech, uh, which frames uh, the reason for the book being published and uh, its postponement in publication and so on has resulted, as I said, in this tragically timely uh, moment when its relevance is at its greatest. And therefore, I think we should take note of what is obtained in this. It's a slim volume edited by Dr. Stephen Chow himself and Dr. Milton Lam. It contains a huge message, slim though it may be, of great significance to all Malaysians. This is the need to fashion a healthcare system in our country, which is sensible, universal, and fit for purpose. Now, as we know, and what has been mentioned earlier by Dr. Stephen Chow, the present devastating COVID-19 health crisis throws into sharp relief the adequacy of the healthcare system. But this book captures the many challenges confronting that healthcare system well before this current pandemic. If the opportunity were to be seized from the COVID crisis, the main thrust of this book for health system reform would have been achieved. The pithy articles in this book cover a more comprehensive set of healthcare issues than the dramatic pandemic pressures we are witnessing. Indeed, they are the kinds of issues beneath the surface that can come to a boil. We have to be careful and sometimes even explode just as we have come to political crisis, after so many years of neglect, of so many corrosive matters of the body politic and of the health of the body too, we have this neglect, this corrosion and this potential explosion, some of which we see like landmines blasting off here and there during this crisis. Already before COVID, 1.85 beds to 1,000 patients was below the recommended rate then of 2.5 beds. There are big issues of overregulation and under consultation, insufficient openness, and lack of transparency. That is the matter of less than universal health coverage, as in Sarawak, Sabah, and among the Orang Asli. The inequality of health care we see in the deaths, suffering, and the vaccination campaign in the pandemic, all these reflect the inequalities that are captured 
in this book. Problems have been accumulating. They accumulate and they can overwhelm. Misconceptions and wrong use of data, which results in less than positive outcome has been happening. More money spent does not result in greater healthcare satisfaction. If most of it goes to overheads and administrative costs rather than actual medical application. There are so many other pertinent matters affecting the people in this book, such as how to improve patient safety, how to ensure fair allocation of fees, housemanship training, so many minutiae, what you might think of as nitty gritty issues, even as we talk about the big picture, the platform upon which our nation and our national health system subsists. The message is loud and clear. It is, as former Director General of Health, Tan Sri Dr. Abu Bakar noted in the final contribution of the book, it is time, it is time for radical review and reform. These things trip off the tongue, are easy to utter, just like President Biden talks so easily about build back better, wonderful alliteration. Things are talked about by our new prime minister, about the family, the Malaysian family, things that trip off the tongue. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. And insofar as the Malaysian health care system is concerned, maladies and remedies are needed. They are needed urgently. They affect lives and deaths and livelihoods, of course. And therefore, this book, as I said, is tragically timely. Finally, let me say, the new cabinet that has been announced, come see, come saw, people say, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other, nothing's changed. It's just uh, sort of uh, moving the deck chairs on the Titanic, it would seem. But if you could try and extract extract a bit of light, a chink of light from it. I think from the Malaysian healthcare system point of view, I think the appointment of the new Minister of Health, uh, Kairi uh, Jamaluddin, I think is a plus. It's a plus that we must use. He's probably one of the best ministers, if not the best minister in the cabinet, and being in the healthcare and Minister of Health, this is a chance that we must seize to make sure, we must seize to make sure the many years of neglect and the many, many, many complaints all contained in this book, the structural weaknesses are addressed, are addressed with him. He's intelligent and I hope the authors of the book and the professionals in the medical industry, in the doctors, of the book, particularly the doctors, reach out to him to try and achieve the change we all desire. So I would recommend highly this book, Malaysian Healthcare, Maladies and Remedies, to be read by KJ himself and by all of us, so as to push the agenda and achieve the change very, very long overdue. Azro, those are my uh, review my review comments. Thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen, for hearing me out. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tan Sri Dr. Munir Majid, uh, all the way there at 4 a.m. and from London. Thank you so much for your review of this uh, important uh, tome of thoughts and insights. I, I really must echo uh, many of the views that you have um, shared with us a moment ago, especially in terms of the challenges that the new health minister will need 
to address and it is going to be easy to be bogged down and even fail if he is unable to look at the different priorities and the concerns from the different health stakeholders and not be able to look at them in an order of priority. It is something of a fact that it is too easy to be uh, focused solely on COVID-19 related issues without recognizing that it is necessary to also look at non-COVID uh, health issues that continue to simmer under the surface. In fact, we look to issues that, that are affecting non-communicable diseases, affecting uh, conditions such as cancer, in which delayed deferred treatment can have knock-on effects, not just in the immediacy, but also several years down, uh, worsening health outcomes for Malaysia in the years to come. So it is something that he will need to be able to look and see and prioritize and hopefully not fail because there's a lot of people who are depending on this uh, new change in terms of the leadership of the health ministry, but also it is necessary for him to go in with an ear to listen to the people who are in the health ministry, the experts, the professionals who have been at it for the past 18 months or so in working to address the creaking health system as it has been described and making sure that it is able to help as many people as possible and to leave no one behind. So it's important that he is able to listen. And perhaps even uh, if I may say, Dr. Stephen Chow, perhaps he should be able to read this book as well as one of his uh, things to do on his very long list. So uh, with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you again to Tansri Dr. Munir Majid for his uh, generous thoughts uh, on uh, this issue. I would like to now uh, go on to the next part of our conversation this morning, and that is to uh, bring to you uh, a luminary trio of uh, individuals who many of you obviously know of, but I would need to still introduce anyway, because you know we really have to be looking at this topic this morning, which is learning from the COVID-19 crisis, and future-proofing the Malaysian healthcare system and to capitalize on the wealth of experience that we're having for this forum. So first of all, we have Tan Sri Dr. Abu Bakar Sulaiman, who honestly does not need much introduction. He is the former Director General of Health, uh, Chairman of International uh, Medical University uh, Group. He is a past master of the Academy of Medicine of Malaysia, past president of the Malaysian Medical Association during his years of practice. Uh, he was a consultant nephrologist, instrumental in building up the nephrology, renal, transportation and dialysis services at Hospital Kuala Lumpur and other Malaysian hospitals. We have with us also Dr. Dr. Yo Ho Hong, an orthopedic surgeon who is a past master of the Academy of Medicine of Malaysia and past president of the Malaysian Medical Association. Dr. Milton Lam is probably known to many of you who are readers of The Star. He is a consultant obstetrics and gynecologist, is a past president of the Malaysian Medical Association and a member of the Malaysian Medical Council. He is also an avid columnist and he has columns, as I mentioned, in The Star, The Doctor Says. With that, I would like to just ask uh, uh, all three of you gentlemen to switch on your cameras and for us to begin this conversation. So let me just get this set up. And we have with us uh, uh, this opportunity to ask questions to these individuals with us today and to be able to ask questions and get them answered in terms of their own experience reflecting on some of those issues that we're facing. If I may ask that you record your questions in the chat box, which is at the bottom of the screen. Please do send your questions to us either through the chat box or if you're watching us on FB Live, you can use the live chat on the FB Live too. So uh, the way we're gonna start is, I'm gonna ask that each of you uh, give an opening statement of, of five minutes and then we'll ask questions from that point on. So, uh, with that, uh, let me ask uh, the first one to start, and that is Tansri Dr. Uh, Dr. Abu Bakar Sulaiman. Go ahead, Tansri. Okay, thank you. Assalamu alaikum, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Stephen Chow, for inviting me to this forum. It's a great privilege to be with all my colleagues here. 
I would just focus my comments on the COVID-19 pandemic, although I will also try to link it up to certain issues that need to be addressed for the medium and longer term. And there may be questions later on. I think if, if you look at what has happened and what are the lessons learned for Malaysia over the last 18 months, well, we did well in 2020 until the Sabah elections in October 2020. Certain things happened. Then the disease outbreak got, got very bad, getting worse all the time. In 2021, we did rather poorly compared to 2020. Now, this pandemic has occurred at an unprecedented unprecedented scale. And to be fair, most countries, including developed countries, if you look at and compare their preparedness and the responses, most of them were found wanting, if not all of them. But our own country, we have a stable and robust and proven public health system. But there was a major failure of public health in Malaysia. Why? Well, I think there's a lot spoken about in the media, in the press, in social media, everybody giving their own opinions. And I think there's a lot of it, a lot of everything of what they say is probably largely true. There was a failure to adapt to changing and rapidly developing challenges in the last 18 months. Our leaders and management of the epidemic, they were not flexible enough to change and deal with new challenges. They were stuck with the policies that they initiated in early 2020. They did not engage with experts outside the Ministry of Health in the country and others who can contribute towards uh, uh, the response. There appeared to be a lack of urgency in, de in dealing with the rapidly developing emergency. There was recognition that we needed an all of country effort in the response. But all the advice given were not taken up until July this year, when the Greater Glen Valley COVID Task Force was formed. So largely, I think a core issue has been the lack of leadership all around, from the top right down to the ground level. And mind you, people on the ground, the few that we spoke to on the ground, they were utterly dedicated, very committed. They have given ideas. And these are people in the health centers in the states, but much of it was not taken seriously. Now, the Director General of Health had commented about the underinvestment in public health and the underemphasis in public health. Well, that's largely true. And in many countries, that is the case. And certainly that is the case in Malaysia. But of immediate concern for us, we must understand the importance of public health in health promotion, in working toward achieving our potential in health, individuals, families, communities. But of immediate concern, we need to have proper policies on vaccination, not only for children, but for, also for adults. Now, the expert group in Ministry of Health has come up with proposals for adult vaccination. And I think that needs to be taken up. Test, testing guidelines have been drawn up by Professor Norman Hakim and his working group in the Greater Klang Valley COVID Task Force. And I think they should also be taken up seriously going forward for the future. Because post COVID, we need to understand about the need for vaccination and for testing. This is very important 
because you want to make it safe for people to go to work, to go out to do their work, to go to school, college, and so forth. Then the cost is going to be significant. So we have to deal with that as well. So the issue is how do we balance our investment in health versus in care? There is no doubt we need more money into healthcare. We also need more money into public health, into health promotion, disease prevention, early detection. We need to have a balance for this. Now, the second issue in the COVID-19 response has been the collapse of the healthcare system, the hospital, the clinics, and so forth. They were completely overwhelmed. You see pictures of patients on the street, in the corridors, in the a &E waiting for a bed, patients outside in queues come, coming to the clinics or hospital. And coupled with that, we don't have enough specialists, we doctors I'm talking about, we don't have enough nurses, and we don't have enough nurses trained in different specialties, particularly in intensive care, for example, coronary care, in emergency care. There were inadequacies in getting data to identify the patient, to test, identify, isolate, and do contact tracing. These were all done manually. And the data took days and days to be collated. So how long does it take to identify a cluster? Can we do it in one or two days? To do that, we need to digitize health. We need to automate the process. We got to manage the data, analyze the data, and go into predictive mode, which we are capable of doing. So digital health policies and practice are going to be very important. And the use of AI and other tools are going to be important for us right now and going forward. Uh, one minute, uh, uh, Tansri. Okay, thank you. There were inadequacies in monitoring patients in home isolation and in quarantine centers. The number of deaths occurring was very, is very, very worrying. And the number of people got in dead is very, very worrying. Risk communication was ineffective, very sadly, very ineffective. Mental health among healthcare workers have always been a problem and been severely exacerbated in this pandemic. Mental health of the population is something that we have to address going forward as well. And lastly, the last point I'd like to make, the ambulance system is totally inadequate. People were waiting days for an ambulance. The ambulance system of the Ministry of Health is meant for inter-institution transport within the Ministry of Health and they assist community uh, needs as well, but that is not good enough. We need a proper national ambulance system to deal with emergencies as well as day-to-day -day work. Okay, uh, Azro, I'll stop there now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tansri. Uh, uh, honestly, my uh, list of questions from your remark alone is quite long already. And that's just starting off with your thoughts. So let me get to the next speaker, which is uh, Dr. Dr. Yeo Ho Hong. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah, thank you very much, Astro. I think I'm going to say things which are already uh, well on the minds of all those attending and also to everyone in the world, in fact. You know? The pandemic has actually challenged our uh, traditional beliefs and understanding of what the whole uh, healthcare system is. And I think one of the, certainly the most shocking uh, thing that the world saw was the failure of the most advanced countries with the most advanced healthcare systems to be unable to check the pandemic. And uh, on the other hand, we find China, which we have not traditionally looked up to for innovations in health, to be the one capable of uh, checking it. 
and then we look at it and see that uh, how has China succeeded where the rest of the developed world seems to have failed. And we find that the people are the most important aspect of how healthcare uh, succeeds. Huh? And in a, in a sense, in an authoritarian uh, system like China, the people are in a sense uh, uh, made to understand that their individual freedoms are not as important as the, uh, what shall I say, the well-being of the population. You know? Whereas in the uh, so-called liberal West, uh, the failure is the uh, liberal system where I as an individual has every say uh, to do whatever I want. Now, uh, Malaysia, uh, we are caught in, in a different situation. As Tansi Abu Bakar has said, you know, there are so many failures in the health delivery system of our country. And uh, when, the, when the pandemic started uh, early last year, uh, we thought we could conquer it, you know, and uh, we were a bit premature in uh, patting ourselves on the back and giving ourselves all sorts of accolades. But when the new variants came in and we see how devastating our healthcare system is and our numbers are so frightening now that most people uh, uh, are so worried about even getting out of their house, uh, houses. That uh, we have to re-examine our system. I think Tan Sri Abubakar has stated so many uh, issues. And if we go through the chapters in this uh, new book, you'll find that Every chapter raises issues. And I know that this book started in 2018. Eh? And I feel that it is important that we should look at all aspects of our healthcare system. And healthcare is not just the doctors and nurses and the Ministry of Health. It involves all agencies and, and the public and the private sector uh, health uh, things like uh, even public works, you know. Uh, so we need a really comprehensive look at the entire system and to plan for what our future should be. The medical profession uh, under the Malaysian Medical Association has for the last five decades actually stated, uh, stated uh, repeatedly that we need a uh, total program of how the healthcare is going to go for the next uh, 20, 30 years. You know? And uh, this, I'm afraid, that can only be done by some very drastic measure. And the Malaysian Medical Association, since uh, the early 70s, to uh, 1970s, you know, have been advocating that we need a Royal Commission on Health which will set out what needs to be done by each individual agency in the government, as well as how the total uh, legal system for the management of the private sector health delivery system uh, will need to be restructured uh, over the next, uh, to, to aim for a certain targets if we want over the next 40 or 50 years. Of course, uh, over the, whatever the recommendations of the Royal Commission, it must be uh, incumbent, you know, that the government must enforce it. And all uh, agencies should make the recommendations, their uh, mission statements. Of course, you may have to modify uh, your recommendations as time goes on. Now... Uh, uh, Dr. you have one, one minute. Okay, my, my chapter is actually based on the, present, uh, on the presentation I made on my uh, Tunku Abdul Rahman oration in 1917. Uh, and uh, my recommendation for health, uh, Royal Commission on Health, uh, is uh, a lot based on the shortcomings already reported by a research report on the Malaysian health system uh, published, uh, I mean, commissioned by the government itself uh, uh, and conducted by the Harvard uh, Health uh, Medical uh, Health School. 
and they published it in March 2016. And I think that already, based on that report, we have sufficient uh, data to conduct a, a Royal Commission of Health. And I noticed that uh, Tan Sri, uh, I think it's appropriate that my first chapter is the Royal Commission of Health. And Tan Sri Abu Bakar's uh, last chapter on the, uh, which it says, the uh, director proposal for Malaysian healthcare uh, uh, rounds up this book. Uh, okay, so thank you so much, uh, Dato, for uh, those uh, remarks. And we go next to uh, Dr. Milton Lum. Please go ahead, sir. It's always very difficult to follow Tan Sri and Yo Po Hong, you know. I don't know what to say, <laughs> but <clears throat> let me just say something about COVID-19 uh, before I go on to non-COVID conditions. I think the biggest reason for our failure to contain it is the lack of testing and consequential contact tracing. We are not able and we have not made the effort to have a <clears throat> target which the WHO has set at 5% or less. Our positive rate is what yesterday was 15%. So for everyone that is tested positive, there are two fellas out there spreading the condition maybe unknowingly. And we have placed a lot of reliance on vaccination, which is not the answer, it is just one of the answers. And there has been two early and liberal opening up of a large part of the country, particularly in areas where the healthcare facilities will not be able to cope with an increase in the number of cases. Add to that, a failure of communication, communication between the policymakers, the healthcare professionals in, uh, in ivory towers and the general public, and a flip-flop in policies of the government, which has led to all this. Health education, what is there in health education on COVID? We do not find much of it. Now I come on to the non-COVID conditions, which has all been put on the sideline because the focus is on COVID. The country is going to pay a big price for not dealing with the non-COVID conditions for diabetes, hyperpressure, high cholesterol, all the NCDs, they are going to haunt us for a long time to come. Thank and you. Whilst, <clears throat> whilst there's additional funds being put into the health sector for the COVID, the question is whether the funds are spent in a targeted manner and to achieve certain results. We already hear of, uh, how should I put it, spending which are not appropriate. Uh, the focus is on security services, when the focus should be on preventive services. Now, in all this, the question of patient safety and quality of care has been thrown out the window. How safe is it? to go to a hospital when one is found to be COVID positive? How safe is it to go to a hospital when one has an NCD? Can one catch COVID when one goes to a healthcare facility? That is the fear that a lot of patients have. I shall leave some of my time later on. Azrul, keep it uh, on. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Milton Lum, for those comments. And definitely there's a lot for us to uh, begin to speak on and comment on. Let me start with a question that comes from Kamani from Code Blue. And I'm going to address this question to all of you. She asks, what are the suggestions in the book that the newly chosen health minister, Khairi Jaldin, should implement? So I'm going to ask for just one low-hanging fruit, if possible, from each of you 
to answer this question. So, um, Tanshree? Well, actually, if you look at the future for healthcare, the first thing we have to look at it, post COVID and before COVID, it could be very different. But one thing I think is will not be different is that the trust of the care services must be at the primary care level. And this must be upgraded to provide more comprehensive services. Potentially, the public services and the Ministry of Health for the rural area is very solid and can be upgraded and they're doing that. But for the private sector in the urban areas, it is still one man show. And this requires, this is where the funding system is critically important. It, it is very limited what one man GP can provide as opposed to a comprehensive primary care center can do. So these are the issues which is very critical and core to our future. Thank you so much, Tansri. Uh, Dato? I think that the political will is very essential in how you want to implement uh, objectives. But the failure is always also political, uh, what you call a political interference in healthcare decisions. If the new minister can be a powerful political motivator, but at the same time, uh, allow the actual health uh, personnel to carry out the correct decisions, I think that will be a great first step forward. Uh, Dr. Multian, thank you, uh, Doctor. The government has to put health as is number one priority. And the health minister must be of sufficient seniority that he can push the agenda in the cabinet. So, you know, all of these uh, items that you've mentioned just now, they all are different uh, aspects of a larger conversation. And, yep. uh, you know, Dr. Malta, I would challenge you to, to, to actually substantiate uh, because uh, you imply that health is not a priority right now, but isn't that what's dominating everybody's consciousness oh, right now? I think the budget... Healthcare, there's a difference between healthcare and health. The priority now is healthcare for those with COVID. But we have all, ignored all those non-COVID conditions. They're all left aside. And this is going to haunt us for a long time to come. But at the end of the day, you are going, you have to reward people to maintain good health so that they need less health care. So this goes back to an earlier conversation that we've been having before COVID took over. And that is the issue of uh, uh, the in investments in curative services compared to preventive services. And, you know, we're looking at preventive health uh, and looking at what kind of investments that we are putting in. The majority of it is in the first part, which is curative services. And it was mentioned just now uh, by yourself, Dr. Milton. But I also wanted to uh, pick up on Tanshri Abu Bakar's point just now uh, concerning funding in health prevention, uh, health promotion. And, you know, I, I'm reminded of the fact that just before uh, we entered 2020, the government at that time repealed and abolished MySihat, which is Malaysia's health promotion board, uh, believing that it didn't have any real function, it was not necessary. And I've I got to say it was our own goal because we needed health promotion entering the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis. And yet the body that was uh, responsible for health promotion was abolished just before we entered the, the COVID-19 crisis. So I'm asking you, Tansri, you emphasize an important point concerning health promotion and how we have underinvested in this, and it's resulting in, in uh, non-communicable diseases, poor health-seeking behavior, poor health literacy. What can we do now to improve upon the situation? Let me just give a bit of background to that. I was still in the Ministry of Health when I 
uh, initiated the reorganization of the National Institutes of Health. And there were a number of institutes. Uh, I won't go into detail, but one of them was supposed to be the Institute of Health Promotion. Now, unfortunately, the public education professionals got slighted because they are the public education for the patients and the community, but they're doing public education. They went to see the Secretary General and blocked the implementation of the Institute of Health Promotion. So it was delayed by a long time. Together with that, I proposed the Health Promotion Board to be formed along the lines of the one in UK. But it did not occur during my time. But after I retired, they formed the Health Promotion Board. But instead of following what the UK model was all about, this board just gave out contracts for advertising and uh, education and so forth, you know? So it, it became something that did not, uh, the performance was not measured. We don't see any improvement. So I think the new minister, Anupakit Maharapan, thought it, okay, we disband that. That was what happened. We still need uh, that body to do the health promotion, disease prevention, research on health behavior, and so forth. The research component is critically important. Uh, Tan, thank you, Tan Sri. Thank you for sharing us a little bit of the background there. We didn't know that, that particular point of history concerning health promotion in, in Malaysia. Um, let me ask you, Dato, uh, you know, you mentioned just now the, the dilemma uh, that often is within the public health uh, space where we talk about individualism versus communalism, the collective uh, well-being. And very often, you know, we point to the West and, and, and say that over there, it's all about the individual. But here, when we're talking about uh, public health in, in Asia, you know, we're able to sort of think along the lines of it's for the benefit of the greater good of the community and so forth. And we see that perhaps that's an advantage uh, here in the Asian uh, communities here. But having said that though, um, how does that inform on our healthcare system? Because healthcare delivery is not based on the collective, it's based on the individual well-being. And how do we ensure that we're able to, to deliver a health system that's able to look at the needs of the individual and respond to that rather than make decisions based on how, you know, like for example, medication, uh, it may cost a million ringgit to provide medication for this one individual, but the same one million ringgit can go for like 10 other patients with a lesser uh, uh, stage of the disease. And how do you make these sort of decisions? If you were at the Ministry of Health, you know, what kind of value added calculation can we put in this individual versus the collective? Go ahead, Dr. I think that uh, we are in a sense, uh, as an Asian country and with a mix of our population, we are traditionally quite uh, obedient sort of uh, group, you know. And I think the government uh, must uh, not abuse our obedience, but rather utilize our obedience uh, to formulate uh, philosophies and uh, what shall I say, measures for healthcare delivery to meet our aspirations. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, and I can see from Tan Sri's uh, reminiscence about some of his experiences is that, as I said, uh, the, I hope the Minister of Health uh, will be committed uh, to actually push for whatever decisions. He has a large group of very qualified advisors, not only in the Ministry of Health, but even in the NGOs who are more than prepared to assist him. And I think that it is important. We must not allow, uh, he must also be strong enough, as uh, Milton says, senior enough, uh, to be able to resist uh, interference you know, from other politicians. Uh, I think we all, we all know, like, I can tell you issues where uh, we have as an NGO or as uh, an organization, made uh, agreements with the ministry during meetings. Eh? 
and then it can be overturned by a friend of the minister who objected to it. I can give you a real example, but I don't think it's okay. not for this forum. But at the same time, that's why I say that political interference over the years for good policies, when it threatens their personal agendas, have always scuttled many of the good projects, even the reorganization of the National Institutes of Health and things like that, you know? Okay. So uh, that is so, my view. Uh, I suppose that, that we can add transparency to that, uh, the need for course, increased think, transparency. But uh, I think we are more fortunate now that uh, with the internet, uh, yeah, there has been more transparency, not because the government is transparent or any particular party is transparent, but, but because oh. the, the internet itself, uh, and social media exposes all of this. So transparency should not be based on exposures, but transparency should be from the outset where you uh, solicit uh, opinions and, and uh, suggestions before you implement policies. Okay, thank, thank you, Dato. Uh, let me just go to another point that was raised, and I would like to just remind uh, those who are participating to just send us uh, your questions if you have any uh, on the chat. Um, Dr. Milton, I need to uh, bring up a point that was raised just now by uh, Tansri Abubakar, uh, which is concerning the lack of leadership. And that's quite a broad uh, description. And if we were going to be looking at where exactly is the lack of leadership on these issues, Tansri has mentioned uh, uh, several instances where this leadership is lacking. What are your thoughts on this issue? Because Malaysia previously was seen as quite um, a good case study in the leadership in this health crisis. And then suddenly at the begin, well, arguably towards the end of last year, it just went downhill. And suddenly it looked like we didn't have that much leadership uh, in the uh, epidemic response, taking care of the healthcare system. What's, what's going on there? Your thoughts, Dr. Milton? I think leadership should be at all levels, not just at the top management, but also at middle management. And this can only occur if there is an open culture in the Ministry of Health, where dissent, alternative views are always welcomed by the top management. If the top management doesn't welcome uh, any uh, alternative view or suggestions, then whatever that the people on the ground or in the middle management proposals may be scuttled. But one has to always remember that the people on the ground or in middle management are the people who know what is really happening. And I would suggest that like in Tan Sri's time, whoever are appointed to the top positions in the Ministry of Health, are sent for management courses abroad, not just for one month, but for a period of time, so that they become better leaders and better listeners. A leader has to listen and not bark out instructions all the time. A leader who listens is going to achieve more than someone who issues instructions. It cannot be my way or the highway. Thank you, Dr. Wilton. That's good. I can see Tan Sri laughing at that because, you know, I think in, in medicine, it does seem to be that way often, you know, and uh, it is treated uh, in, a, in a real sense. But I do hear you there. Um, you know, there's a culture of fear in medicine, you know. Yeah, yeah. Particularly in, 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 uh, in China, in, even in Malaysia. Well, you're, you're a member of the Malaysian Medical Council, so you would know about some of that, right? Uh, Malaysian Medical Council has only two functions, register mm -hmm. doctors and discipline doctors. There's no other function that the Medi Malaysian Medical Council has, although its members may influence thinking. Uh. Okay, thank you, Dr. Walton. Very cryptic there, but I I'm going to ask Tansri Abubakar here. We have a question here for, uh, you know, we have medical students going back to hospital during the COVID-19 uh, situation. Uh, is there... 
a strategy that could be introduced to facilitate continuous medical training. I think the issue here is, is perhaps their training has been disrupted due to the uh, COVID-19 situation and them being utilized for uh, you know, some of the frontline work and therefore they aren't able to continue necessarily uh, uh, what their syllabus is supposed to uh, do. And because you're uh, the um, chair of the International Medical University Group, perhaps you have some insight there. Go ahead, Tansri. Okay, thank you. Uh, but first, I'd like to make a comment about leadership from uh, Milton Lam. Uh, go the ahead, first Tansri. act of caring. Yes. The first act of caring is to listen. The first act of leadership is to listen. I think very important. And for doctors, they really need to learn to listen. Okay. Now, the, the use of the hospitals for teaching now has been disrupted very badly. So certainly at IMU, at IMU we've been using this clinical skills lab for many things. So what we have done now is to invest hugely to upgrade the, uh, the clinical skills lab so that uh, what a lot of what's being done can be done in the lab until we can get to go into the hospital safely. And that depends on when the government decides we can do that. Uh, I assume when most people are vaccinated and you still follow the SOP and so forth, uh, even then there will be a risk. But uh, what we're doing now, so we have always been using standardized patients. So now we have to retrain uh, the, standard, the standardized patient to be broader in the things that we need them to do. And we also need to have more application, a lot of computer software and so forth. And so we are, we are doing that. We're investing in a major way. Now, this is actually very radical, but I am you, we've been doing e-learning for a very long time. So in this COVID outbreak, when we had to do these type of things, you know, online lectures and so forth, we've been doing it for years. So we were ready actually in many ways. And also we liaise with our partners from overseas. They learn from us, we learn from them to upgrade the, the skill center. <coughs> but you know, with the competency model of education, we got to define skills and expertise that the student must achieve before they come into contact with the, with the patient. So now, it is even more important. So we're doing that type of preparation. Thank you, Tansri. And, and one of the things that uh, we probably need to look at is how uh, the symbiosis, uh, the symbiotic relationship, you know, between the Ministry of Health hospitals and the Ministry of Higher Education uh, hospitals as well. You know, uh, we often don't think about the university hospital, UCM, USM, UM, all of which uh, play very important components in. Uh, the healthcare space, but, you know, suffer from a lack of attention, and even uh, less funding when you compare to what you have in the Ministry of Health. So in order to do some of the things that, that you're talking about, they require substantial investment, which requires commitment, but most importantly, preparation. And IMU sounds like it was well positioned before this all began to be able to just go into it, I suppose. Well, that's on the teaching side, but as you on the healthcare side, now that you mentioned this, when Anwar Zaini was vice chancellor of UN, I offered to him, why don't we work together to get an adequate budget? Adequate means we all got to agree for the university hospitals. But you got to follow the government hospitals. You have certain targets to, uh, to meet, which has to be agreed on by treasury. But Anwazani refused. They want independence. So that, that became quite difficult because the function of the university hospital in healthcare is very critical, as critical as the government hospital. And they can do a lot, you know, but then the issue about accountability is the same. So they cannot say they don't want to be accountable for the money that they're given. Uh, they cannot. Uh, so they have to change the paradigm there yeah. because, you know, for a hospital, the first function is to treat patients. Second function, to treat patients. Third function, 
to treat patients. You do all that very well. You can do, you can use it for teaching. You can use it for research. Uh, thank you very much, Tansri. Uh, we're going into a little bit of extra time here because there's some exciting points that have been raised. Uh, I just wanted to um, raise uh, a question. Um, and this is, any one of you can comment. Uh, and this is the challenge that we've uh, basically faced in this COVID-19 uh, public health emergency where there are competing claims concerning the effectiveness of different approaches or medication that's being used. And we have, especially uh, last year, we had hydroxychloroquine that was uh, brought up and claimed that it would be able to, to uh, cure COVID-19. And now we are running this uh, ivermectin uh, back, uh, you know, ground war or something, you know, where, where people are claiming that this is a even a substitute to the vaccination that is ongoing and even claiming that it can cure people at categories four and even five of, of, with, with COVID-19. And the thing that hasn't been spoken about is, is very much the lives that have been claimed as, as a result of uh, this uh, treatment. What has been spoken a lot about is the supposed claims of it being able to, to, to successfully treat. So, you know, science evolves and we, we want to be able to accept uh, contrarian opinions. We want to have debate. I think Dr. Milton mentioned just now as, as well, you know, we have to have space for some of these discussions. But during this critical time where we have these issues and we have, uh, you know, uh, purported claims of, of such treatments being more effective than uh, others, such as uh, uh, actual vaccine, how do we you know, working in the healthcare space, address these issues? How do we go about addressing it properly and not being entirely dismissive? How do we respect the opinions given, but at the same time win with the argument? What can we use? So I'm going to ask first, uh, Dr. Milton, go ahead. You know, I was reading about a great plague 400 years ago and how people responded to the great plague and comparing it with our time today, to COVID-19, which is similar to a plague. Uh, the human response hasn't changed in 400 years you now. And we tend to believe in a lot of things that are bandied about, just like in those days. So as far as ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine or any other drugs, today we have the benefit of evidence-based medicine. And I think we have to go by the evidence, notwithstanding whatever claims, that may be made by anybody. And uh, the regulators have to address this in a manner that is easily understood by the general public. Thank you, Dr. Milton. Uh, Dato? Uh, you're muted, Dato. Uh, Dato, you're muted? Wrong, oh, you're muted. You're muted, muted Dato. Unmute. I think that the one very important issue that we face today is the powers uh, of the uh, giant pharma industries you know, who control many of the decisions made by government. And uh, little now is placed on the, uh, or the individual or collective experience of doctors. You know, uh, Milton Lam says evidence-based medicine. I think that's important, but evidence uh, it comes in multiple levels. Right. Let's say for me, as a practitioner for the last 48 years uh, in orthopedics, uh, there's one particular procedure or one particular medication that I use, uh, which I find is universally effective. You know, I, uh, and I, just like the doctor in uh, America who says she has treated 300 cases of COVID with hydroxychloroquine and not a single one of them have died. And we get multiple reports uh, of uh, ivermectin where they have given it to frontline workers. I think in uh, Argentina, for example, 500 were given ivermectin and 300 not given ivermectin. And the uh, 500 frontline workers looking after sick patients every day, none of them died from COVID. But I think 58% of those who were not on ivermectin contracted COVID-19. But 
I think one of the things we have to say is that if you are a doctor and you have been treating and you have got your records to show that the medication you give, so long as they are not dangerous, you know, is effective, then maybe you should be allowed to continue. Uh, ivermectin, I'm afraid, uh, is such a safe drug. I cannot understand why there are so many uh, interested parties in blocking it. I, I, would, I, I, I want to make a confession. Uh, because I go to hospital every day, I'm taking ivermectin every Monday morning so that I'm pr protected for the rest of the week. <laughs> Okay, Doctor. I don't know how to respond to that, really, Doctor. But Tansri, I'm looking to you for a response uh, on the question. Go ahead, Tansri. Yeah. Well, look, Bohong, if you want to practice evidence based medicine, you've got to walk the talk. And that can be very difficult because it's very emotional. Particularly in this situation, when there is no treatment for stage one, two, one, and three, the treatment is mainly when patients get really bad. But look at the mortality rate. It's about 1% or less. So most people are going to survive anyway. Now, but, but let, let me just, Azrola, let me explain about evidence-based medicine and the approach, and the approach of science. Because we want science to drive our decision-making, okay? Look, science is the search for truth. All science is measurement. All measurement is comparative. Now, at present now, when you go by the conventional method of combined clinical trials, so far, there's, been, there's not been very strong evidence in favor of ivermectin. But we have, as Bong said, a lot of case reports saying the benefit. And I think People can be swayed by that, which is fair. Now, the issue about ivermectin right now, when they're looking at combined clinical trials, you know, it can be the 5% that benefit and the 95% that don't benefit. You have to understand that. So the next step is to go towards comparative effectiveness research because uh, clinical trial is an artificial setting not real life setting. So if you want to now see which of the people will benefit and which will not benefit, you've got to go to com comparative effectiveness research. And that is something that somehow or other people are not ready to go yet because for the clinical trials alone, they don't see sufficient data, but you've got to go to comparative effectiveness research to be able to tell whether ivermectin is useful or not. To my mind, you cannot exclude the benefit of ivermectin because, what do you call it? In vitro, there appears to be some benefit, okay? At the cellular level, in the lab, but we're talking about in human beings. It's, the jury is still out. We need more data and data come in. So it's very frustrating when you tell people this. It's not something they want to hear. Look at you, Paul. He's impatient. He takes it. Well, that's okay. <laughs> As you said, the drug is safe at the right dosage once a week. Okay, that's three. Uh, okay, we are actually uh, over time now. And I just wanted uh, to give a chance to uh, all three of you. Um, one minute only, yeah? One minute only. If you had a chance to talk to the health minister and his deputy health minister, ministers, today, what would you like them to hear? Or would, what would you like them to do? What would be the message that you would like them uh, to have as a takeaway? So uh, let me start with uh, Dr. Dr. Yeo first. Go ahead, Dr. I think it's, I, I find it very difficult to advise ministers, you know, uh, but I, I would like to plead with him to at least uh, listen to all sectors. You know, I once uh, uh, made a remark to a politician about the qualifications of, or my perception that he has no qualifications to be a minister. But uh, this particular politician told me that often the best ministers are those which do not have very much knowledge of the, uh, like for instance, health, you know, because then they are willing to listen. And 
one particular minister who, whom I was criticizing, he was not minister of health, you know. He was in another portfolio. But he says that he's a very good minister because he doesn't think he knows everything. And he listens to everybody before he makes a decision. That is what I would like to uh, say, if I may, to our minister. You know, listen to everybody, particularly your top advisors and those you trust, even in the private sector. And include your friends. I'm not against friends in uh, advising the minister. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dr. Yeo. Uh, perhaps you can start being his friend now. You know? <laughs> uh, Dr. Milton, go ahead. I would go along and say listen to everybody, not just from the ministry, but also from the universities and the private sector. And last but not least, listen to the patients. That is something that many ministers have not done so. Uh, thank you, Dr. Milton. I, I think somebody chimed in and said, listen to the right yet there. So I heard that. Uh, <laughs> uh, Tan Sri, go ahead, sir. Well, you know, KJ is very intelligent, very hardworking. And so far, as a vaccine minister, he's been infected. So I will take a punt, okay? Go for the medium term, longer term, because we need that. Malaysia's healthcare is very similar to that in the US under the capitalist democracy system, under the capital, you know, uh, capitalistic system. All healthcare system, the healthcare funding is not sustainable. So I would tell KJ, hey, have a look at what New Zealand is trying to do and what US is trying to do in implementing the triple A number one, and then have a look and understand the value-based value healthcare approach that will help to implement the triple aim. Because in the US, and Malaysia is very similar, they spend over 4 trillion US dollars annually, and over 1 trillion US dollars is utter waste. So the first thing we want to do take that approach, cut down the waste. That's to me very important. And balance, get a balance between health and care. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dan Sri, Dr. Abu Bakr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dr. Yeo Ho Hong. And thank you, Dr. Milton Lum for your, I think, excellent repartee. And certainly the discourse that we've had this uh, uh, for this session, for uh, I think trying to articulate and to describe some of the things that we can do today, especially within the COVID-19 backdrop and the context of using some of the recommendations from the book for the health minister to consider and to be implemented. I think a lot of those have been kicked down the road by different administration, hoping somebody else will do it instead of their own. So, uh, thank you again to all three of you gentlemen for that. I would like now to invite uh, our president of FPA, MPAM, uh, Dr. Stephen Chow, to come back again and close uh, today's uh, event. Go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you, Nasrul. Uh, I think there were a lot of uh, take-home points for those who care to listen. Okay. Well, I hope they don't just take it home and do something, but do something about it. Uh, as I say, the launch of this book has been postponed twice uh, due to change of government. Uh, I dread, I fear that you, if you ever have to write and launch another book. <laughs> anyway, it has been a great, great Saturday morning. Uh, I wish all good luck, stay safe, okay? And uh, I wouldn't say stay at home, but uh, what we need is sensible precautions, okay? Not the kind of SOPs that were thrown around a couple of years ago, okay? Thank you so much, uh, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Stephen Chow, uh, for those parting words. And definitely we look towards 
the possible utilization of the recommendations of uh, from this book to be used in the health agenda for Malaysia. So uh, thank you again to all of you who have stuck from this morning all the way up until now uh, to participate in the launch of the book, uh, Malaysian Healthcare Melodies and Remedies, uh, which you can now order from FEMPAM. And don't forget uh, to uh, follow uh, the discussions concerning healthcare uh, through FEMPM's uh, events. I would like to just say thank you very much to uh, the uh, uh, committee uh, of FEMPM for putting together this book and for putting together the, uh, the recommendations that can be considered for this incoming administration. So thank you to all of you for uh, participating. Uh, and I do hope that in uh, the coming uh, months ahead that we'll be able to look towards improvements in our healthcare. Uh, with that, uh, I'm Azra Mokkalib from the Galen Centre for Health and Social Policy. Uh, thanking you all and wishing you all a good weekend ahead. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.